Well, glory to God. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Church on the Rock this morning. Hallelujah. We also want to welcome those who are joining us by live stream. Have you come ready this morning to give him praise? Hallelujah. Let's stand to our feet. Let's just begin to give him praise and glory this morning. Father, we magnify you in this place. We glorify you. We thank you that this is the day that you have made. We choose to rejoice. We choose to be glad in it this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. This is the 
I will bless the Lord at all times. Come on, let's lift our hands and bless Him this morning. Lift your hands and give Him praise today. Father, we bless You. We bless You, Lord. As the psalmist said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Father, we honor You in this place today. Father, we're excited about You today. Father, we honor You and bless You. And no matter what we face, no matter what it looks like, we thank you, Lord, that no matter what it is, no matter the storm, it will not steal our praise. We will praise you and bless you and honor you and give you all the glory and all the praise. And we thank you, Lord. We give you praise today, Father. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. We do bless you, Lord, with all of our hearts. We bless you. With our mouth, we bless you. We open our mouth and we bless you, Lord. I say, I bless you, Father. I bless you, Lord. I love you, Father. And I give you praise and I give you glory. Hallelujah for all that you are, all that you're doing. Hallelujah. And we bless you, Lord, continually. No matter the storm, no matter what it looks like, we will continually bless your holy name. Hallelujah. How many of y'all know your praise is the victory? How many of y'all know that your praise is the victory? Hallelujah. How many of y'all know you can go through, go through some things and you don't feel like praising God? You don't feel like blessing the Lord. But how many of y'all know in those moments, that's when you need to throw your hands up and bless Him anyway. And say, Lord, I know you are a good God. I know that I'm getting on the other side of this in the name of Jesus. And I choose to bless you. I choose joy. I choose peace. I choose to bless you right in the midst of what I'm going through. Because you are a good God. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you, that's what we need to stay in a, in, a, in a posture of praise. Just like Pastor Nancy said the other day, just lifting your hand in the morning, in the afternoon, all throughout the day. Father, I bless you. And that, that has nothing to do in the world with what's going on in your life. It's because he is so good. And he is so faithful. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, praise the Lord. How many of y'all excited to be here today? Man, we've been having meetings starting last week. We just took a couple days off. We got Pastor Nancy back. Amen. And uh, so we asked her to come. And we, it's just such an honor and a treat to have Pastor Nancy here. And uh, I, I asked her if she would stay. Well, she was already staying over. She's resting and things. And I said, would you... Would you want to take Sunday morning? We'd love to have you. And she said, of course I will. So we're honored to have her today. Amen. Her and Dee Dee uh, traveling with her. Amen. Just a blessing to have you, Pastor. I don't know about y'all, but those, those meetings, I'm not saying that. I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, I don't just use words to use them. But I'm telling you, that's some of the best meetings I've ever been in in my life. Such a, just, just such a powerful flow of the Holy Ghost. Just such unity, such an ease of the, the spirit of flowing through this place. I, I was so blessed, so encouraged, and so built up inside. And so what's really good is we got all of them archived. So you need to go back and, 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 and listen to them over and over and over. I'm telling you, you can get a lot off the CD too, or off the podcast. You probably don't listen to CDs no more. But anyway, praise God. If you weren't here, I don't know what to tell you missed it it was awesome it's really really awesome amen so we're honored to have pastor nancy with us this morning i want to ask you to go ahead and greet, turn around and greet somebody and tell them you're glad to see them this morning amen praise the lord the Lord I don't know about you but I'm excited about today and uh, it's such an honor for me this morning to receive our offering 
Uh, and we're going to do this just once. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings as well as a special offering for Pastor Nancy. Amen. So on the offering envelope where it says guest minister, just put Pastor Nancy. Or if you're given by texting, just make sure you put on there Pastor Nancy. And we'll make sure that she gets uh, the offering this morning. We want to be a blessing. Amen. And I want to say this before I give you a few scriptures on the offering. I just wanted to thank you as a church. Uh, for your generosity this week and your giving and and uh, I know you go to work every week and you work hard for what you have and I just want you to know I appreciate you as a pa as the pastor of this church me and my wife appreciate your sacrificial giving we appreciate you and all that you do but thank you for your serving thank you for the offerings thank you for everybody that did everything it was just outstanding and uh, I just appreciate you you're just so benevolent and uh, and I'm grateful amen but we want to receive an offering for Pastor Nancy. And I want you to open your Bibles real quick. I won't take long. Um, but in Mark chapter 12, Mark chapter 12, how many of y'all know uh, when you're giving, it's important how you give? And I would venture to say it's more important how you give than what you give. Because how you give is connected to what you give. The house first. Are you with me? In other words, if your heart's in something, then the amount's really, God has your wallet. Are you with me? But if I don't put my heart with my giving, then what I put in will be minimal. And I'm going to show you this in the Word. In Mark chapter 12, and I was studying this last night and then this morning, and verse 41, and it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and look at this, and beheld how. Look what was important to Jesus. He beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. Now, the treasury was not an offering that they was receiving for the church. This, was, this, this treasury, they called it a poorer's box. And it was set in the temple. And people would, at a certain time, in this particular time, they would donate or they would give money in this box. And then they would take that box and they would distribute it to the poor. That's significant in this. Amen. So they were actually receiving an offering for the poor. And Jesus is paying attention to this. Now that's significant because of what we're getting ready to read. Are you with me? And notice he said he's watching how they give. How many of y'all know he's watching how we give today? And it says, and there came, verse 32, or 42, and there came a certain poor widow and threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto them his disciples and said unto them, verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast in more than all they which have cast into the treasury or the poor's box. Notice he, this woman is poor. Yet she's casting money in for the poor. She has a heart to help. She has a heart to be a blessing. This isn't an offering they're just taking up in a service. This is an offering that they're going to take up to distribute to the poor. And she's poor. Amen. And the Bible says in verse number 43, she gave more than all of them. And you know what this, uh, this word than all, that means all of them combined. All of them combined that day that put money in that box to distribute to the poor. Jesus looked at them and he said, come here, boys. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you what's important. What's important is how. Here's a widow woman that's coming in to put money into a poor box for the poor and she's poor. Her heart is in her giving. Her condition didn't matter. Her condition and where she was did not matter as it relates to what she wanted to do in her heart. And so now she's giving into this. And, he, and when Jesus said she gave more, the word more means more in quality. More in quality. How many of y'all know if God has your heart in quality, he will have your heart in quantity? Are you with me? Then in verse 44, and it says, For all they did cast of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even 
her living. And what this really meant when it said her, her living, she would work on a daily basis and all that she would made the day before she gave. So here's a woman that comes up and puts a few little cents in that she made all her living, all that she made to live that day. She is now giving it into a place to distribute to the poor and she was poor. Amen. And so Jesus is looking at this, and what stood out to Jesus was the honor, not the amount. He said they cast in abundance, but she cast in of her want. She cast in, her heart was in what she was doing. She gave all that she had. So what was important to Jesus in this was the heart and the honor that was in the giving. Because I'm thoroughly convinced, as many years as I've been given, when God has your heart, the amount is irrelevant. It's unimportant. And usually it's large because God has your heart. Amen. Not that you have to give all. I'm not preaching that. What I'm saying is that she had a heart to give. And even though in the natural, it looked like she ought to hold on to everything she had. She loved God so much. She loved the ministry so much. And she wanted to be a blessing to the poor. And so she cast in all that she had. How did she do that? With her honor, with her love. Hallelujah. And I don't have time to go there because I'm going to stop. But if you go over and read, and I'll just paraphrase. You go over and read Acts chapter 10. And it's astounding what happened with a man that wasn't even born again that gave alms to the poor from his heart. He gave, wasn't born again, but he gave out of love. He gave out of his love for God. He gave out of his love for the work of God. And he gave to the poor. And it says he gave abundance. Here we have an example of someone that just had a little bit and gave. Now we have another example of Acts chapter 10 of a guy who has abundance. But God has what? His heart. So the heart is when the person that had just a little bit. And now the heart in giving is a person that has abundance. And you know what the Bible says in verse 4? It says... An angel said, you listen, your, your offering to the poor, your offering has come up for a memorial before God. Something is being built up before God, and he's not even born again. But he had a love for God, he had a love for prayer, and he had a love for people. And now this memorial has come up before God. And as this memorial comes up before God, God recognizes that memorial. Now this is all having to do with an offering. All has to do with giving. You know what happened in, in verse number 5 and 6? He said, send men to Joppa. Somebody's being sent now because of an offering. He said, send men to Joppa and go get Peter. Amen. This ain't Joppa. Go get Peter and bring him to you. Something's being brought because of an offering. He never even went. His servants went to Peter, and he caught it up in a vision. You know the story. Peter caught it up in a vision. He said, go to this guy. Why? Because of his giving, because of his heart. It brought a rescue to his life. Not the money. The heart in what he was doing brought a rescue back into his life. And all of a sudden, they came to him. Peter came to him and started talking to him about the Lord Jesus Christ and him being crucified, etc., etc. And he got born again. The Holy Ghost fell on them. There was a supernatural increase into this centurion soldier's life because of an offering that he gave. And he was given in abundance to the poor because his heart was in his given. And in this particular case, and I'm going to stop, but in this particular case, it was amazing. I started looking at that. I thought, Lord... He gave this offering. He loved you. He gave with all of his heart. He's given this offering. And then all of a sudden instruction comes. What you need to do. He didn't buy it. It was his heart. This memorial's coming up before him. He goes, now I'm going to give you instruction. I'm going to show you what you need to do. And then he said, send men over there. And they sent men over there. And then something is coming back from an offering. 
And it rescued his life. Amen. And I want to read this, and I'm going to stop right here in verse 4, out of Acts chapter 10. And it, there's a whole teaching here. Acts chapter 10, verse 4, and Amplified particularly. And it says, And he, gazing intently at him, became frightened and said, What is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, Your prayers, listen to this, and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by him. What are they, why do they erect memorials in a remembrance? To remember something. And God says your gift and your giving to the poor and your heart and what you've done has come up of a memorial before me. And from that became a divine rescue into his life. Hallelujah. And so as we're giving this morning, when we're giving this morning, we're giving with our heart. We're giving with our heart. And you ask the Lord, Lord, what, what, what would you have me to do this morning? Because if God has my heart, he's got my wallet. There's, there's nothing I have that has glue on it. It's all subject to be given away. Why? Because I love God. Amen. 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 Isn't that good? Amen. You ought to notify your face that was good. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Really good. Powerful, man, I'm telling you. And so don't overlook when it comes time to giving as something that's menial and something that doesn't really matter much. That it really don't matter how much I put in the offering plate. It matters how much you, it, not only that, but it matters your heart and what you're doing. So let's receive an offering this morning for Pastor Nancy. And, uh, and let's be generous. We are a generous church. Amen. If you're giving by cash, please lift your hand and take one of these envelopes. The ushers are in the aisle and they'll serve you. Praise the Lord. And make sure that you fill that out in its entirety so that we can rep uh, properly receipt you. I think a lot of times in our giving, I'm not accusing you of this, but I think a lot of times in our giving, we don't do think much about it. We just throw money in and let it go by. Instead of really using our words and really using, you know, and thanking the Lord for what he's doing in our life and really engaging. You know, our, in our offerings, we should engage with God. It ought to be an engaging there. There ought to be, God, I'm so thankful. God, I'm so appreciative of what you're doing. And it's an honor to give. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, hold your offering in your hand. If you're giving by text, you can, uh, they have the text to give up there. You can do it by text to give. Or, uh, so hold your offering in your hand. Father, we're so grateful this morning for all that you're doing in our lives. And Father, we sow this morning from our heart, not from a grudgingly or a necessity. We sow with a cheerful heart that we love what you're doing. We love the local church. We love Pastor Nancy and her ministry. And we're grateful for her ministry now going all over the world. And Lord, we have a part to play. We can't go all over the world with her, but we can help send her. And so it is a great honor for us to be able to, to sow this seed into her life for all that she's doing for you and all that she's done in our lives. We're so grateful. And so we thank you, Lord. We release our faith with our seed, and we thank you for it. And everybody said, let's go ahead and put our, uh, if we could put our confession up there as a church. Uh, this is so important that we release our faith in this. You have that, you have the confession. Uh, praise the Lord. Oh, there it is. I was looking back here. <laughs> Sorry. On count of three, let's, let's uh, say this together. One, two, three. Divine increase is moving upon this church family. It's moving upon me. It's moving upon my family. And we shall flow in the fullness of what that increase holds. Financial increase, numerical increase, the increase of anointing, the increase of healing, the increase of miracles, the increase of the gifts of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's all stand up if you would. Let's just lift our hands and glorify God this morning. Let's worship Him. Father, we thank You. We worship You. We glorify You. Oh, we thank You, Father. We give You the highest praise because You are worthy. And only You deserve the highest praise. Thank You, Father.
deposited into each and every one of us you have entrusted much to each and every one of us we'll never diminish it we'll never treat it lightly but we honor all that you have put in us so that you can flow through us in a greater way and we give you thanks and praise and glory for it and everybody said amen um I want to say a great big thank you again. It's fun to be back here again, yes, so soon. It didn't take so long. And uh, I, I'm so honored to be with you. Thank you, pastors, for having me this morning. And the pastor thanked you for your generosity. But again, I want to thank you for your generosity. I mean, it was over and above. Um, and we appreciate it so much. And, you know, I appreciate when pastor was talking about Cornelius because one of the things that stands out to me so much is this was a man not born again without the life of God and it it would not behoove us for a man who did not have a covenant to outdo us in our giving Amen. Amen. but not only that we see that for God to bring the gospel into the Gentile world it took a giver yes. to open the door for the gospel and uh, why? Because giving is an action. It took an act of faith. Not just somebody saying, I love God, but never following it up with an act. Your pastor always talks about, over there in Proverbs, um, about that we honor the Lord with the first fruits of our increase. Talking about, it's a giving. I, I love this, this word, we honor the Lord with. You can't honor the Lord without. 
you can, your honor has to be with something. It, it, honor, honor has to be attached. And whatever it's attached to demonstrates the degree of the honor. And like he was saying, it has to be attached to not just an amount, but to the heart, a giving heart. Amen. And so uh, we see something that Cornelius, uh, he led in the Gentile world in his giving. Not just in amounts, but in his interest in what God had. And it took the heart of a giver to be the open door. And we're standing here because of the heart of a giver. Yes. We're, we were Gentiles. Yes, we're now the church. Yes. But because of Cornelius' heart of giving. And when you have a giving heart, it opens the door for God to do something for others. Amen. Because that's what we see demonstrated. That the whole world was affected by one man's giving. Yeah, it was his heart. It was his interest in God. And when you show interest in what God has done this week, no telling all that's going to play out in this community and through this church because the heart of a giver opened the way for God to go further with his word in the lives of people. So thank you for that. And all over the world, wherever we get to go, amen. So thank you for that. And the reason, one of the reasons you had the heart of a giver is because you're taught well by your pastors and so hallelujah Halle so none of us can congratulate ourselves right our success and our obedience is connected to someone else to another man that taught us what that's what that looks like amen hallelujah we'll turn around to three or four people give them a great big God bless you this morning then you can be seated Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. I don't know about y'all, but I had a good time. I trust you had a good time. Uh, I don't know if any of you gotten any rest yet, but it'll come. It'll come. But thank you so much. I know that it takes a lot of hands, a lot of hours, a lot of time, and uh, a lot of love to so as you did to into the meeting. So thank you so, so much. Um... I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 4 today. Philippians chapter 4. Um, I, I, had, I had in mind to go one direction last night when I went to bed, and when I woke up, the, the direction was different. And uh, I, I love it when God prescribes something specifically yeah. for us. Amen. And um, when I started in... July, our daily broadcast started airing on the Victory Channel, which is Brother Copeland's ministry, his network. We started weekly in January airing on his broadcast. But I started in uh, February filming for the daily that would start in July. And uh, God led me in, to... First teach on the mind. And I spent the first 80 episodes teaching on the mind. Didn't exhaust it. But just thought, well, we probably need to move on. <laughs> but 80, that's 40 hours of just teaching on the mind. Because if we get that wrong... Nothing else works as it ought. Yeah. That's right. That's good. That's right. Everyone's got a mind. Yep. <laughs> you got to know what to do with it so that you can receive what God has for you yeah. and be a channel through which God can do great things. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Wrong thinking shuts down everything God has. Right thinking is an open door to God. So the more we think right, the more we cooperate with him. The further we move with him. And you say, well, it's my faith. 
you have to think right to even have faith. Wrong thinking will uh, limit faith. Right thinking takes the ceiling off your faith. Takes the lid off your faith. Takes the limits off your faith. Uh, Right thinking produces right believing. Right believing produces right actions. Right words. And God's power meets actions and words. Amen. So wrong thinking produces wrong believing and wrong believing produces wrong words and wrong actions and thereby closes the door to the power of God Mm -hmm. it all begins in our thought life it all begins in our thought life and what we allow into our heart is going to affect our thought lives wrong things come But you have to keep them out. Just because something shows up at the door of your life doesn't mean you have to open the door. People show up on the porch of your home and they knock. Why? Because it's up to you who gets in. Right? Right? It's the same thing with your thought life. Just because wrong thoughts show up doesn't mean... That you have to open the door. Yeah. Come on. I've had people come to my door and I look and I see who's there going, mm mm, not even dealing with this today. Amen. Not even. Right. Yeah. No, I got no time for this. No, no. No time for this. That's what, when my husband went home to be with the Lord, one of the first things I said to the kids, don't you touch this in your thought life because I don't have time yeah. to pull you out of a hole of depression, oh. grief, and sorrow. Amen. We've got to be up and running like never before because of this transition. I didn't have time. I was telling them, you cannot open the door to the wrong thing. And I don't care how long something bangs on your door. I don't care. Somebody can come to your door and stand there just for maybe a few moments and knock and realize, oh, they're not going to open and they walk away. Then you get some people that are rude. And they will just stand there. (laughs) <laughs> you know, especially if they know you're there. Uh-huh. They see your car. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. There have been times when somebody knew I was home and I'm just not going to deal with them. Yeah. I just wouldn't even open the door. Yeah. Amen. And just because you can hear them knocking doesn't mean they're in. Just because thoughts are banging against your head, that's no sign they're in. That's a sign that they're trying to get in. Yeah. And the devil wants to make you think that because something's banging on your head that your faith is failing. That's a sign that you haven't let it in yet. Amen. Amen. You can't stop who knocks on your door. You can stop what happens with your door. Amen. 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 And so God dealt with me about teaching on the mind because everyone has one you cannot sit here today and say this doesn't mean a thing to me it means a lot to you (laughs) and the thing is you never can you can run off and leave your purse at home your wallet at home uh, something else at home but you can't run off and leave your mind at home you can't get away from it So you might as well become skillful with it so that your mind doesn't ruin your life. So that your mind doesn't rob you of peace and joy. Your mind is not the source of your peace. Your mind is not the source of your joy. Once you're born again, the nine fruits of the human spirit that come in by the Holy Ghost are in you. And it's up to us to cause those uh, fruits to grow. Love, joy, peace, and all. It goes on and lists those. Those do not reside in your mind. 
You don't look for those flows here. Yeah. You look for them from in here. Amen. And you draw them out. Yeah. You stir them up. Yeah. And fruit grows. You have, a, you have a fruit tree. That fruit grows. And as the tree gets larger... More branches and there's more fruit. Why? So that someone can partake of it. When something shows up that doesn't have joy, no problem. You got your own joy tree. You partake of it. You pick the fruit. And you eat it. You partake of it. And your thought life is part of that. Amen. Amen. I said it this during the week sometime, but I said, um, not every circumstance in life is going to offer you peace or going to offer you joy. That's yeah. no problem. Yeah. 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 You brought your own. Yeah. And people who are only living off of the peace and joy that a circumstance offers them oh, is living a troubled life. Yeah. Yeah. Because many only know how to draw from out here. What people say. What circumstances offer. What money they get. What money they lose. They only know how to draw out here. But there's a fountain that springs up. That you're to drink of. That's to water. So a sound mind that belongs to us in Christ. We turn this way. And we draw out of our spirits and no one can do it for you your spouse can't do it for you your parent can't do it for you your pastor can't do it for you all they can do is remind you what's in you that's all but we have to be skillful at the dark 30 of life turning this way when, every, when there's great pressure on the mind, when there's great difficulty, great challenge, that you turn here. You have to practice that because the, it's natural to turn to the natural. It's natural to go this way. We practiced our whole lives going this way. As children, it's all about this way. As young people, especially before we're saved, it's all about this way. And even when you're saved as a child... The, you still have to learn that the flesh mm -hmm. wants to go this way yeah. Yeah. and you have to retrain yeah. yes, that. Amen. Amen. And the mind is part of this yeah. because everything that comes to your mind did not come from your mind. Right. 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 Now right. that's what you have to learn. Yeah. Everything that comes to your mind yeah. did not come from your mind. When God speaks to you and deals with you, it's from here, from your spirit, from your insides. When the enemy comes, he comes from outside striking the mind. But when God speaks to you, it has to float up from the inside and enlighten your mind. It has to arrive there. But it begins here. When Satan comes... And anything of the wrong flow, it comes from out here and still arrives at the mind. Now, this is where the strategy is. Learn where did that come from? Did that come from here or from out here? And you must be very discerning. Because the devil, does, he wants to portray himself as the leading of the spirit. So he will try to imitate as closely as possible the dealings of the Spirit. Why? So that you're confused. And you'll yield to something from out here, but it sounds so soft and friendly to the thought life that many people aren't guarded and they're not recognizing. <clears throat> The devil can, the devil's a liar. Yes. A liar will use truth yeah. to further his lies. Yes. Yes. 
you, 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 I don't know if you've ever met a person in life that my mother used to say about different people. She'd say, they'd, they'd lie when the truth would sound better. <laughs> because they're liars. Yeah. Yeah. They get into that flow that they couldn't tell the truth yeah, come on. if their life depended on it. Yeah. Just yeah. out of their own character. Their own character is so compromised. Yeah. That they just get into that flow of conjuring up, lying, exaggerating, yeah. nothing. You, you don't have confidence in anything they say. Yeah. Um, the devil's the same way. Yes. But he will use truth to benefit the lies he tells. For example, um, Paul and Silas, remember, had a... Paul had a dream. Man of Macedonia appeared and said, come here. Mm -hmm. So they go to Macedonia. They're going, they're, they're, they're ministering in that region. And there is a girl with a spirit of divination following them. She's like a fortune teller yeah. following them. She's not born again. She doesn't have the life of God. Yeah. But she's saying something. And she's saying, these are servants of the most high God. They show unto us the way of salvation. Yeah. Nothing wrong in that. Right. Absolutely true. Right. Yeah. How did she know that? The familiar spirit yeah. she yielded to yeah. knew them. Yeah. She's saying the right thing. Yeah. Why? Because even though she's saying right words, it's the wrong spirit saying it. Right. Yeah. And I guarantee you there was a repelling yeah. going out with those words. Yeah. Yeah. Pushing people away because it's an evil spirit. The words sound good. Mm, so they don't dismiss her. But then because there's an evil spirit that she's yielding to. You get around someone that's yielding to an evil spirit and they are repelling. You'll be grieved in your spirit. There's a repelling with that. Haven't you? I don't know if you wouldn't may probably even have it here, but I've been in services when someone operating under the influence of the enemy and they do something and it like sends a dead feeling out yeah. over the whole congregation. Yeah. Yeah. It's not because of what they did or said. It's because of what motivated them, yes. that spirit they were yielding to. Yes. So this girl is yielding to an evil spirit. And even though she's saying the right words, it looks like she's on their side so that people will listen to her. She's following, but it's sending out the wrong influence. Yeah. And, it's ending, and it's ending working up a repelling. Yeah. Paul, this went on for many days. And it says, Paul said, it says about Paul, he was grieved in the spirit and turned around and rebuked the spirit. Yeah. Right words, wrong spirit. Right words, wrong spirit. Right words, wrong source. In your mind, you can hear right words, but you better know the source. Yeah. Discern the source. Because the devil will say right words to deceive you on, is this God or is this the devil? Because you'll dismiss it thinking, God would say that. God would do that. And all of a sudden, you start believing a wrong spirit and you start losing proficiency over what came out of your spirit and what came out of your what came against your mind. Yeah. That's so good. He wants to deceive you. He wants yeah. to confuse you. Yeah. What right. came from God, what came from the devil. I don't like the statement when preachers say mm -hmm. at offering time, if you hear two numbers, God is the bigger one. That's a lie. That's a lie. There's no scripture for that. There is no scripture for that. You know what you have to do to be scriptural? Have scripture. Yeah. <laughs> Ringy dingy, there's a light bulb. <clears throat> I have had God tell me an amount. And then another thought came. You better give this. You better give. And there's a little bit of a push with it. There's a little bit of a drive with it. And if I would have given the bigger amount, it would have put me in a bad place financially because I only had faith for the amount God told me to give. You can't have faith to give for what God didn't tell you to give. That's what I'm talking about. 
You have to discern because what God says comes up to the mind and what the devil says comes to the mind. You've got to discern the source. And they're not always obvious. It takes practice. Will you miss it? Probably. As in, the, as in the learning. But as we go through life, we, sh we should become more skillful. If every thought that the enemy sends to you is obviously wrong, he's shot himself in the foot just by his approach. Because you're going to immediately recognize. God said to me several years ago, when I speak to someone, with my words come an influence. It's called the anointing. I've never heard God speak and not sense the anointing. I've always sensed the anointing with it. Sometimes in a greater degree, sometimes in a lesser degree. And he said, I send an influence with my words to help you receive it. That's good. It helps you receive it. Yeah. Yeah. You recognize yeah. that anointing. That anointing softens you. That anointing so blesses you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it helps you yeah. receive it. He won't make anyone, but he will certainly make, he can certainly influence yeah. with that anointing yeah. so that people can make the right choice. Yeah. Mm. So good. Now, the devil, there's nothing original in him. There's nothing creative in him. He is a distortion of everything that's already in, 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 in play. He's an imitator. And not even a close imitation. A distorted imitator. So he will imitate how God operates with distortion. So when the devil says something... He also sends an influence mm -hmm. to try to get you to believe that which he just suggested to you. Yep. Have you ever had words like, you're not going to have enough money mm -hmm. to meet the upcoming mortgage payment? Mm -hmm. Or you're going to lose your job? Or something that, that strikes like a fiery dart mm -hmm. to your mind. It's significant to your life. You know you're facing that need coming up. Yeah. And he sends those words. Yeah. And when he sends the words, they carry an influence to where you feel that way. Mm -hmm. You feel like, I'm not going to have enough money. Yeah. You, feel the, you yeah. feel the tangibility of those words. Come it's the, Just like God's words carry an influence of yeah. the anointing, Satan's words carry an influence of fear. Yeah. You believe yes. There, that fear becomes tangible to you. What's it trying to do? To persuade you to accept it. Just like the, just like the anointing of God persuades you to accept what God's saying. It helps you to receive. The devil works the same way. I don't know if I'm just whistling Dixie up here, but you know what I'm talking about. That's why we say you can't walk by what you feel. You can't walk by what you see. Because the devil can conjure up things. Out here in, the, in this realm, in the mental realm, your mind is Satan's battleground. Your mind does not belong to Satan. But he wants to launch... Against your life, he uses your mind. Why? He has access to it. He only has access to the door. He doesn't have access to what's beyond the door. All he can do is offer suggestions, threats. That's all he can do. He d cannot open the door to your mind. No. He cannot. No. Right. You are in total, you are the total custodian of, yes. your, of your mind. Yes. God is not, you are. Yes. I am. Yeah. Good. Amen. 
You are the custodian. What gets in, gets in at your, at your opening. The problem with us word of faith people is this. Is we have learned what not to say. That's, that's good. <laughs> We've learned not to say things out here so others can hear. Yeah. But not everyone's learned what not to say to themselves. If you wouldn't say it in the hearing of someone else, you cannot say it to yourself. Because saying it to yourself is still saying it. Just because it never came out loud does not mean you're not saying it to yourself. I've been there. And if you haven't been there, you, you, you don't know you were there. But you've been there. Amen. Yes, ma'am. And it was like a skill that doesn't recognize you were there. When you lay down at bed night, and, and you, you and your, your spouse agree, all the money will come, and you lay in bed at night and you worry, uh-oh, now yep. you have not learned to keep saying yep. the same thing to yourself that you said to your spouse. Now, a sound mind is one who doesn't say something different to itself mm -hmm. than it says in the presence of yeah. God. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't let him think he'll receive anything of the Lord. He won't. You can be one-minded with your pastor, with your spouse, with fellow church members, and go home and in your thought life be another-minded. It's called double-minded. Won't receive. Your thought life has to come into agreement with your confession life. Yes. They have to be the same. Yes. Yes. Amen. And I'm talking about someone who's confessing the word. I'm not talking about somebody who doesn't know to confess the word. Yes. It's not skill to just say, I know to say the word. Right. Right. Skill is, I know to think the word. Yes. And say the word. Yes. Because you can say the word, but wrong thinking will undo every yes. bit of it. Yes. And this is what you will spend the rest of your life being skillful in. Does it get easier? Absolutely. Absolutely. Once you gain a level of skill. For example, in practicing the piano, I was a, a piano performance major. So all of mine was classical. So people say, can you play? They would... Somebody would say, can you play this? Give me time, I can play it. Why? Because the skills are there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The skills are there. I have to learn the piece, though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the skills are there. I can do the skills. I can do the arpeggios. I can do all of that. But I've got to learn the piece. In every test and trial, you have to learn the piece. But the skills are, should already be there. The skills already there. It may take you 30 seconds to <laughs> apply the skill to that peace and the more you practice the quicker you can learn the peace not P-E-A-C-E P-I-E-C-E -E, the piece of music the more I practice it, it won't it, if I haven't practiced in a while it'll take me longer to learn a piece but every piece I learn I get quicker and quicker and quicker it's the same thing with the mind it's the exact same thing with the mind you can have the skill set in place, but if you don't apply it, you're going to lose proficiency. But the more you apply it every day, every time a wrong thought comes, every time a troubling thought comes, you apply it. You get quicker every time recognizing that. <clears throat> four different times, four different seasons of my life that I went through very difficult, hard tests for me. It took me every one of those four seasons. It took me complete, a complete three years 
before every trace of it was gone. That happened four times. That's 12 years of my life. The first, six, the first three months were hell on earth of each time of that. Six months was difficult. By a year and a half, life looked pretty normal. But every trace of it, it was three years before every trace of it was gone. My husband used to say, every 10 years, there comes an attack. Now, see, you can learn the pattern. For me, it happened at 18, 28, 38, 48. My husband died when I was 52, and I was doing the mental countdown. Mm -hmm. I'm at 52, 53, yeah. 54. And that 58 number, you weren't looking forward to. Right. And one day, God said to me when I was 57, he said, just because a test comes doesn't mean you have to enter it. And then he said this to me. You entered it on the pr four previous times because you lacked skill. But he said, now you got the skill. You don't have to enter it. But he said, but if you do the mental countdown thinking you have to enter it because your husband said every 10 years, he said, then you'll enter it. But he said, I'm just telling you, you had the skill not to. Amen. I go, you're right. You're right. That test came. It was not even 30 seconds before it was over. What used to take three years. See what skill did? It turned three years to 30 seconds. Skill. One of the most important things in your life is skill yep. in the thought arena. Because you can throw faith at it all, the, all you want, but an unrenewed mind will completely dismantle faith. Your life will only be as good as your thought life. It won't be as good as your faith. It'll be as good as your thought life. So I'm just, I'm, what I'm doing, I'm trying to interest every one of you yes. in this. Yes. In this. Yes. When, you're, when you're skillful with your thought life, your faith will flourish. It yeah. will grow quickly. It'll be easily. Yeah. Part of the difficulty, and I'll preach to preachers. I'll say something to preachers, kids. And, and I say it because there's a lot watching. Your thought life, you're not skillful at your thought life because you're a preacher's kid. In all the years of my husband and I in ministry, we saw children leave, leave the family of God, go, go, in the, go into the world, go a totally different way. Why? They had no skill in their thought life. You can't live under the umbrella of your pastor's skill, your parents' skill. And I taught my children early, you better do something with your mind. I'll be here, I'll tell you, I'll help you because I've been there. I know what to tell you. It took me 12 years to be skillful because I, I didn't hear from anybody what to do. I looked. I read in books. I searched in books, and I could not find. Just give me steps. Yeah. If you tell me to take step one, yeah. two, three, four, I'll do it. But I couldn't find anybody. Yeah. I couldn't find it. And that's why it took me 12 years because I, I would get through tests, and the way I get, got through them is I threw everything I knew at it. And you know what? That's quite scriptural. Having done all to stand. Right. Having done all. Yeah. If you did all, you just threw everything you knew at it. That's scriptural. Yeah. But the only thing is, I didn't know which of what I threw got me to the other side of it. So every one of those four year, every, every one of those four seasons, I just threw everything I knew, and I'd eventually get to the other side because I'm not quitting. I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to walk away from the plan of God. I'm not going to. I'm not going to. I'm. I'm not going to back up. I'm not. I was having my head beat out, but I just wouldn't quit. And if you'll not quit, God will pull you through. But I don't want to be pulled through. I want to walk through quickly skill does it quicker than no skill try it on a computer 
Try it on anything. Yeah. Someone with skill, they'll get it done before you do. Yeah. 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 Right. I don't care what it is. Yes, fixing a car, building a house, fixing a door. Someone with skill will get it done quicker than somebody with no skill. And you say, oh, no, I can slam a jammer. Yeah, but it's going to fall apart. Yeah. You, might, you, might do the, you might do the Band-Aid method, yeah. but next week it's going to fall apart and hurt more people. Yeah. Cost you more. Yeah. I'm not talking about the slam a jammer. I'm talking about skill. Yeah. I don't appreciate slam a jammer. I've, I've had too much of that. Yeah. And some people live a slam a jam a Christian life. Just don't learn skill. They just, they just, you know, rely on others. They don't, they're not interested in their own personal growth. Not interested in anything put on them. That slam a jam stuff falls apart, baby. It falls apart. <laughs> and everybody can see the crack. The, 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 the joints don't meet. You got cracks, you know. Takes a whole tube of caulking just to halfway disguise it. <laughs> y'all, y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <sighs> I am so grateful for what I've learned through those tests because I said, God, if you will teach me the steps that I took that worked, I'll teach it to people. I don't want them to suffer and struggle the way I did when it felt like my mind wasn't my mind. Now, don't, don't, don't think I grew up weak-minded. I didn't grow up weak-minded. There's one thing I wasn't. I wasn't a worrier. I didn't have a poor self-image. I didn't have the struggle. I was not a pessimistic person. But when demons show up, they can produce feelings that if you're not skillful, those feelings will convince you of the wrong thing. And I will get to those steps that God took, took me through. But uh, I taught my children, I can't win this battle for you. You have to win the mental battle yourself. I can't win it for you. But I can stand there and tell what you're doing and say, don't do that, do this. Don't take that thought, take this one. I can tell you what a right thought is. I can tell you what to do in the face of what you feel. So that what you feel doesn't change what you believe. That's really why the devil launches against the mind because he's trying to get you to change what you believe based on what you feel. You believed you were healed before, before, before pain came. Keep believing that when pain comes. You believe God was your provider when all your bills were paid. Keep believing that when it looks like the money's not going to be there. See, that's all. Just keep believing the right thing. Because I tell you what, when the mind is attacked, you will feel, you will not only hear the wrong thing, you'll feel the wrong thing because of the influence of those wrong yes. words. Yes. You'll feel them. You'll feel them. And I taught my children. And that's why they have carried on with the plan of God. Because I taught them, you have to, I can't win this for you. Your pastor can't win it for you. Can't win it for you. That means you must engage in this Great work of renewing the mind, coming into thinking with God's thoughts. Pay attention to your thought life. Quit being permissive towards yourself. Quit being easy on yourself. Well, you know, it was the way I was raised. So? That might be a cause, but that's not an excuse. I don't diminish. Some people were so mistreated in their early lives. I don't diminish that. But what are you going to do about that? You're not required to fix that. You're required to live above it. Not only required, you're empowered. And until people quit talking about how hard it was, they won't talk about how good he is. Change the shift. Come on. 
from how I've been treated, how somebody, and then people give themselves permission to feel beat down, act beat down, live like a victim because they like laying the responsibility for their life on that person who mishandled them. God won't let you claim that before the judgment seat of Christ. That will not, that argument will not hold up because the blood cleanses that. So you can't, you cannot plead a cause that is cleansed before him. And if life is not what you want it to be, when is it going to be? If you're not joyful now, when's it going to be? If you're not peaceful now, when is it going to be? It's up to you. I decided I will never live another tormented day on this earth. I will only live days of heaven on this earth. I will not. The devil has robbed 12 years. A measure of the fullness of joy for 12 years he robbed it. He's not getting anything else. And you know what those 12 years bought me? Skill. They bought me something. And now I'm on a television sending it all across the world. 80. When, when Paul said, what I'm going through is because of you. For your benefit. That what God comforted me with, I send it on to you. In one of those tests years ago, years ago, I might have been, uh, I was probably... 38 and I I didn't I, I, I couldn't sleep I got up one night and I just went and sat in a chair and stared out the window and Ed came down and he said what you doing I said I'm just sitting here just trying to hold it all together yeah. we're not called to cope <laughs> we're not called to manage and hold it all together but that I didn't know what I know now. I don't want it to take you as long as it took me. If you'll listen and apply it and quit living by what you feel. Quit believing your feelings. Quit believing your emotions. Quit believing how somebody treated you. God offers you something better. You know, it, you know if, if somebody handed you a piece of candy as a child and it had already been sucked on and it had fallen in the dirt and it's got dirt on it and there's ants on it and stuff. And then somebody else comes by and hands you a great big colorful rainbow looking lollipop that's wrapped up and brand new. And they say, here baby, you can have this instead of that. And you go, no, but this is what I have because that's just all they gave me. And I don't, that's the way a lot of people, they hold to but you don't understand how they treated me and I don't need no, 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 because it gets them attention, but it's the wrong kind. What God offers us is new and shiny, baby. New and shiny. Yet people just hold on to that sticky, ooey, gooey stuff that... And then sit, so they can cry and get that attention. You go, you're not talking to anybody here. I, I know I'm not. <laughs> I'll just talk to somebody else's flesh, not yours. But the devil has made your mind his battleground. Because he has access to the door. He doesn't have access to your mind. He has access to the door to your mind. He can't come in unless you let him. Right. Somebody said, and it's right, it's right. And they would said, take no thought saying. Over there in Matthew 6, verse 25, Jesus said, take no thought for your life. And then he goes on, take no thought saying where? What we misunderstand is saying happens out here, but saying happens in here. So we think if we don't vocalize it, we're winning. But then why is my head still being beat out? 
because of what you're saying to yourself. You take a wrong thought offered you by saying it to yourself. Turning it over in your mind is saying it to yourself. Thinking about it is saying it to yourself. You say, Pastor Nancy, that thought just slams into my mind. Some thought, whatever. Finances, your body, whatever. Some thought just slams into my mind. I'm trying to get rid of it. No, 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 no. You don't have to get rid of it. Turn your back to it. What did Jesus do when Satan said something about worship? He turned his back. Get thee behind me, Satan. What's that mean? I heard you, but you're not getting in. To show you're not getting in, I will not give you my attention. When Peter said, oh, no, it's not going to happen to you. You won't be offered up. You, you won't be, you know, all this bad stuff that you, you just told us is going to happen. You, it's not going to happen to you. What well, Jesus say? He turned his whole body to him. Then he said, get thee behind me, Satan. In a moment, that's what you do with the wrong thoughts. You turn your entire attention away from it. How, does it, how did it get turned over in your mind? You put your attention on it. The devil makes your mind his battleground because there's no faith there. Mm, that's good. Yeah. There's no faith there. There is no faith in your mind. Mm-hmm. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. So he puts you, tries to draw you to the arena where there's no faith. Because faith whips him every time. Faith is in your heart. It's in your spirit. There is no faith in your mind. Yet, your mind can be renewed with the word so that it agrees with the faith in your heart. But your mind, you can't believe with your mind. You cannot believe with your mind. Your mind can only agree with what your heart believes. This is a spiritual giant. Someone who believes with their heart and their mind agrees with what their heart believes. That's a spiritual giant. Those are the people that change the earth. Because not only are they tending to their spirit life, they're tending to their thought life because the mind is the gateway to your spirit. If your mind says no, your mind won't let it into your spirit. God says something to you, but your mind rejects it. Why didn't you get saved before you did? Your mind rejected it. When did the new life of God come in you when your mind agreed? Your mind had to agree, and then your heart was open to receive it. But somebody can come and preach to you and you go, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. No, I'm not getting born. For, for a year and a half, this is, this is bothering that, isn't it? For a year and a half, a man invited my husband to church. Unsaved. And Ed wouldn't. Colorfully. <laughs> he declined. Colorfully. And in that... He could have been saved a year and a half earlier, but his mind said no. And because his mind said no, the truth couldn't reach in his heart. Your mind is the gateway to your spirit. If your mind is troubled, it's going to limit what the dealings of God you'll accept. The pastor will talk to you about how God wants to make you rich. You go, yeah, yeah, I can't. I, I, just, I, I, I just can't receive anything from people. Yeah. See, their mind talks, and yeah. it doesn't even have a chance to reach their heart. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so the devil seeks to create so much commotion yeah. up in the mental arena so that you're occupied up yeah. here right. where there's no faith yeah. instead of occupied down here where there's faith. So our skill is to refuse to go to that mental arena and be held there. And instead, 
we stay in the faith arena, which is the spirit arena. That's where your faith resides is in your spirit. You can't, you can't teach this to people all in one service, but you've had a pastor who no doubt has taught you these. So this is not new to you. But we're wanting to say things in a way that helps you grab even more. Even more. I, somebody was interviewing me uh, just a, few, a couple months ago, and they said, Nancy... What was your darkest hour in life? I said, there's, I can't say there was a darkest hour. They're talking about what event. Right. Yeah. Right. I said, when my husband died unexpectedly, I said, that was a tragedy. But that was not the darkest time of my life. I said, the hardest time of my life was when my mind wasn't renewed. And I didn't know the answer to the difficulties that showed up. That was so hard. When you know the answer, it's not hard. There's no more dark. Because the light of the word won't let anything ever be dark again, no matter how tragic it is. I know too much. I know too much. Life will never be dark for me again. Amen. I've got too much light. Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. And I told him, I said, it's not one event. And people are baffled when I say my husband's home going. That was the greatest tragedy. Don't misunderstand me. But that was not the hardest time because I knew what the word said. I knew what the word said. And as I told people, when he died, I know too much to act like I don't know it. The difficulty with many Christians is they've been taught the right thing. And they lay down the right thing when the wrong thing shows up. They go back to the way they used to think. Back to the way they used to act. And they're built on the sand. And that sand gives way under them and can't support them. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. The greatest defense against the devil is a renewed mind. It's your greatest defense. Those Christians who do not take the time to renew their mind are open prey. They have to rely on someone else to bail them out. And that is dangerous. A Christian who is in bondage to anything is not in bondage to the devil. They are in bondage to an unrenewed mind. An unrenewed mind will hold you in a place of defeat and you can't blame the devil. A renewed mind means taking on the thoughts of God, making them your own, and letting them govern your everyday life. Amen. If they're not governing your everyday life, your mind's not renewed. Mm -hmm. That's right. Being able to quote the scriptures is not the renewing yeah, of the mind. Right. Yeah. Worshiping God in a church service is not the renewing of the mind. The renewing of the mind is... When you take a, what you've been taught of the word and you put it into every situation and every moment of your life, that's how the mind becomes renewed. It's the word lived. The word lived in everyday life and say, this is the way my life will be. It's my choice. Amen. Um, with every encounter with the enemy, we are to face that encounter with the full knowledge he has already been defeated. Yes. No matter what shows up, the one who opposes you is already a defeated foe. Right. You don't have to yeah. defeat him. Amen. In fact, you can't. That's why Jesus came and did it, because right. you couldn't. Right. I couldn't. We were no match for the devil. Jesus defeated him 
then handed us the win. So anytime something shows up, you're showing up, devil, to someone with the win. I've already got it. I'm not trying to win this thing. I hold the win in my own spirit. And I hold it in my thought life too. An unrenewed mind thinks that they've got to get something. There's one letter that can keep you either defeated or in victory. And it's either an E or an O. I got to get or I got. I'm trying to get healing. I'm trying to get prosperous. I'm trying to get peace. No, no. It'll always elude you because one letter is missed. You're one letter away from enjoying everything in you. By saying, I, instead of lose out of your, your, your vocabulary, I'm trying to get. I've got. I've got. And every time the devil shows up with feelings, with thoughts, with lack, you say, I've got. Changes everything. Amen. Amen. So anyone who's in bondage to anything of the devil... It's because they don't realize they got. And they're not honoring to what Jesus already made theirs. And that dishonor will keep it el eluding them. Satan, in every encounter with him, you approach him. You see him as... Completely, utterly defeated, stripped, regardless of what I feel, regardless of what my emotions are doing, regardless of how they may be raging, regardless of the, the feeling of the fiery dart that strikes. I don't care what I feel. You have already been so totally defeated and stripped, and you will not sway me off of I've got. I've got. I've got it. I've got it. And that's what he's doing. He's trying to sway you off of that because it's only faith that calls it got. It's unbelief that calls it get. Say, God has made you master. Satan is our subject. He is not our boss. Dominating, pushing us around, wrecking our life, robbing our peace, stealing our joy. Mm -mm. Those days are done. Because I went from E to O. I went from get to God. Not just in my verbiage, but in my thought life, in my insides, I take it. Amen. Amen. Um, several years ago, there was a, um, an encounter. There were particular symptoms that kept me awake. It only showed up at night. And it was a physical thing that kept me awake. Yeah. For two years... I didn't sleep. I would sleep maybe three hours a night. And then after several days of just so little sleep, then my body would crash. And then I would go for one night of good sleep and then several days of no sleep, then one night of good sleep and several. So this went on for two years. And in the traveling ministry, that don't work. <laughs> Especially. But in the, child, in the life of the Christian, that don't work. And so um, I just, you can get so busy and so much on you that you don't have time to tend to you. Yeah. You're just running to keep up without out here. And so I, I just said, you know what? It don't matter if this gets done because if this doesn't get done, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this doesn't get done. There's no more this getting done <laughs> out here. 
And so, I just, one, one particular day, I mean, I just started taking my stand, I mean, I mean wholeheartedly undistracted, taking my stand. And it wasn't just a couple, of, a few hours that started working. And, and those symptoms started leaving. But in the midst of that time when I first started taking my stand in a bold way, not just a half heart you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, I resist that in Jesus' name. And then you walk off and you, there's no more faith to it. Right. <laughs> that, that, that half-hearted stuff. Right. That just don't work. Um, but I had a dream after that first day of taking my stand. And I was laying... It was though I was laying in the backyard. There was a home. I didn't even see the home. I just knew it was a home. But there was a large spread of green grass. And I'm laying just out. You know how you'd lay in the grass. Sunny day, bright day. I'm laying there just flat on my back. And you know how sometimes you perceive that somebody walks up to your... You didn't necessarily hear them. You just kind of sense. And you look to see. That's what happened. I sensed that there was something there in, in that dream. And as I'm laying there, just flat on my back, I turn my head just completely. I don't even turn my body. I just turn my head to look. And by the time I turned my head, there was the head of a serpent. And he was here. And you talk about startling because, you know, you didn't see him like 10 feet away. When you turned, he was right there. But when I turned... It wasn't the head of a serpent. It was the head of a serpent. It was at least a foot wide. And you can imagine an enlarged picture of a serpent. And that head was massive. And I saw probably about this far back. You know, when I turned to the side. And the massive. And when I turned, I didn't even have time to turn back because he was already here. Because the natural, you just flinch, right? You turn a different direction. In the dream, when I turned, his mouth, as soon as I turned, he opened his mouth. And I thought, he's going to come over my face because it was right there. But he didn't. He flipped up and he went over and clamped his head on my, his teeth on my head. What was that? He's after your mind. He's after the way you think. That's what God was showing me. He's after your thinking. So in the dream, he has now come and he's clamped on to the top of my head. And when he did, God picked me up. And it was like I was looking down on the scene. And when I looked down on the scene, because when I was laying on the grass and saw him, I could see about this much, you know, just because of the angle you're at. But when God picked me up, and it was like a cherry picker. He picked me up and I looked down on the scene. His body was only about this long because the rest of him had been ripped off. I'm not talking a clean cut. It was a shattered, jagged, torn. God was showing me. He's all talk trying to get into your head he's got no substance left to him dad Hagen made a statement and you need to know this it is he said the devil has been stripped he's been defeated when Jesus defeated that old serpent I mean he is shattered and that's one word that is used in the Greek for him, shattered. I saw that. That flesh was mangled, yeah. meaning no mercy. No Total <laughs> destruction. I, I mean, it was like if, if you had this massive snake and they had tied one end to a tractor and one end to the other tractor and just pulled, that would have not been a clean cut. That's exactly the way this looked. Dad Hagen made this statement. He said, talking about Satan, he's been totally and utterly defeated. He's got nothing left. He said the only thing he has left is the power of suggestion. What he threatens you with. 
what he says. You're going to die young. You're going to have this. You're going to get sick. You're going to, it's all talk. He's got no ability to back it up unless he can get you to believe it and say it. And then he takes the power of your words and defeats you. Because his words don't have any power. Yours do. I love something Brother Copeland said. He said, everything the devil has, he stole. He's a thief. The peace that people don't have, he stole it. The joy people don't have, stole it. Everything that has been stolen, get it back multiplied. But you have to have skill. You can't be in the posture that you were in when he stole it. You have to be in, in skills position. Yep. Then I'll close with this. <clears throat> um, I was working on a particular project, a ministry project, years ago. And two weeks before that was done, up out of my spirit came these words, floated up to my mind and said, you don't think anything with the anointing on it is going to go unchallenged, do you? I go, ah, oh, shoot. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and uh, then about a week later, you don't think anything with the anointing on it is going to go unchallenged, do you? I go, no, I don't. I sure don't. What's he doing? He's letting me know. Be watching. Watchful. Be vigilant. The day that project was finished, I walked into my home. It was probably uh, oh, about 11 o'clock at night. And the moment I walked in, the spirit of fear was present. Now, just because you can feel fear doesn't mean you're fearful. Know this, Satan is the most tormented being in existence. He is a tormented being. When he comes in or anyone sent by him, an evil spirit comes, you feel what he is. When the presence of God comes into manifestation, you feel what he is. The peace, the love, the joy. Because when he shows up, everything he is is with him. Right? And you sense that. When his presence comes into manifestation. Well, likewise, when the devil shows up, everything he is comes with him. Wow. It's not yours. Right. It's right. his. Right. Just because you can feel fear, yeah. it's not yours. Yeah. Just because yeah. you can feel anxiety, it's not yours. Yeah. Right. Just because you can feel pain, it's not yours. Yeah. It's his. Yeah. Yeah. It's not yours. Yeah. It's his. Yeah. Now, if he can get you saying to yourself that that's yours then you'll take on what's his. But if you took it on, you can kick it off. Just as easy as you took it on, get it off. By refusing to believe it's yours. You say, that's not mine. That's not mine. I'm not taking it. That's yours. You're going to have to go home with it. So I walked into my home and I felt that fear. I had learned I was in the process. Remember I told God, if you'll teach me the steps I took that got me on the other side of that yeah. so that I want, I want to know accurately what steps so I'm not just keep throwing stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. And I was in the process of learning that. One of the things he had taught me was, number, was to answer the spirit. So when that spirit of fear, I walked in, I recognized that's fear. So I said, spirit of fear, you leave. I talked to it. If I could say it was bumped up right against me when I walked in. And when I said that, he stood off. And I know where he stood. He stood in the corner of that entry area. He just stood there. And I said, no, you got to leave. And he just stood there. Because when I walked in, he said something to me. He said, this project is going to fail. This project is going to cost a lot of money. And it's going to bring great embarrassment to the ministry. He spoke those three things. And just stood there. And when I spoke to him and I said, fear, you leave, he stood off. But he didn't go. And that, that baffled me. Yeah. 
Because in this process that I was learning, I learned if you answer the spirit that speaks to you, he's got to leave. But he didn't leave. I don't know everything, so I just do what I know. And I said to myself, I'm going to bed. It's bedtime. <laughs> In faith, I'm going to bed. I'm not going to get, stay up and give this thing attention. Yeah. Right. I know that faith is all about your attention, what you're going to have your attention on. Yeah. And sometimes you have to go to bed in faith when, yeah. the, when, the, when the flesh wants to sit up and worry about something. Right. Right. So I said, no, I'm going to bed. And I went off to my bedroom. Had great difficulty fall, falling asleep because that spirit followed me into the room. He was not up against me. But he was at a distance in the room. And he stood over there in the corner by the door. And I said, God, I know he's here, but I don't give a rip. <laughs> I refuse to give him my attention. So I went off to bed praising God. I woke up in the middle of the night. It was hard falling asleep. I woke up and I could sense that it, that, that was tangible in the room. The biggest thing wasn't the fear I felt. It was those words. Have you ever seen a cartoon and one character hits another one with a hammer over the head and then a circle of stars yeah. like a halo? It just keeps moving. That's what I was dealing with. It wasn't so much the fear I felt. It was those words, those three things he kept saying going around my head. So I'd wake up and those words are just circling and they're circling and they're circling. He's not saying them. They're moving on their own because he already said them and he's standing there. Yeah. I woke up early in the morning. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and, and it, it wasn't the fear that was the problem. It was the words. Yeah. Though they were trying to get in. They were trying and they were applying pressure mm -hmm. to the mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to get in. I said, no, you don't. No, you don't. You're not getting in because I know you answer things. Yeah. So I woke up about 5.30. And the moment I did, the word of the Lord came to me. He said, you answered the spirit that spoke it. You didn't answer the words he spoke. He said, when he spoke those words, they began movement. And he said, you have to speak the words that stop their movement. You're trying to stop him, but you haven't stopped the words he spoke. And that's why those words are circling. They're, they're, he's not repeating himself over. Those things are just moving. So I saw it. I had to answer specifically. Remember what he said? The first thing he said, this project's going to be a failure. So I said, you said the project will be a failure. It'll not be a failure because it's birthed of God. Amen. Anything that comes out of God doesn't fail. Amen. See, I answered it with truth. I didn't give it a scripture necessarily. With truth. You can say things in truth that aren't necessarily a verbatim scripture. But they're, the, the, the scripture depicts that truth. The second thing is you said that it's going to cause financial hardship. There's no such thing as financial hardship for me because I have a supply. I'll always have a supply. Even when I miss it. If I miss it. I have a supply from my father. Who will cover me in my miss. So I, this will not hurt the ministry. Number three. You said it would bring embarrassment. Nothing with the anointing brings embarrassment. That's right. Amen. Amen. The moment I answered. All three of those things. Of course those words stopped moving. Because truth stopped lies Amen. Yeah. Amen. when Satan sends words those words will trouble people yeah. until you stop them yeah. Yeah. how do you stop them you don't tell the devil to leave you don't the words will stay there even if he does yeah. leave yeah. 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 words are they have a force yeah. Right. Yeah. they're a living thing yeah. and you have to stop the life of that by speaking that. Then, after I spoke those and those words stopped, I could still feel the fear. And I said, now you leave the room. And that yeah. spirit left. Yeah. And I said to God, how come the spirit stayed? When I told him to leave, he said, because what you don't resist has permission to stay. Oh, that's 
I said, I, get, I told him to leave. He said, but the words gave him the right to stay because something of him you didn't resist. His words. He was standing there seeing what you were going to do with those words. That's what he was watching was the words. He was watching the words. Is she going to let him in? Because if he, if I let him in, then he can attach himself. And it won't just be words anymore. Now it'll be fear. And I got it. We got, we got the steps. That no matter what opposes you, number one, answer the words specifically, yes. not generally. I answered in line with the threats he made. Many times people will say when they're going through something, oh, God loves me. That's true. He loves you, but that's not the answer when the devil says you're going to die prematurely. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. You can't answer general words to specific threats. Yeah. You have to answer the threat. People say, well, I don't want to give the devil that kind of attention. He's already got your attention. You talk to God in fellowship, but you talk to the devil in authority, and you better learn how to talk to him. Number one, answer the words. What words seem to trouble you? You're just not good enough. You'll, ne you'll never measure up. You'll, you'll never succeed. You better answer those words. Right. Number two, answer, tell the spirit that spoke them to leave. That spirit is there waiting to see what those words are going to produce. Yeah. And it's a spirit of fear that speaks to you. God's not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Number three, after you've done that, you worship. And I would say this, not just in tongues, in your known language. Why? To not bypass your mind. Tongues bypasses your mind. And your mind can be unoccupied and still be harassed. So I would say take time especially to worship in English, your known language, because that employs your mind so that your mind is not available for those suggestions to come back and try to get your attention again. Because those words will try to come back, but if you're worshiping, your attention is not on them, and they can't get in. I hope you know the three steps. I just told them to you. Number one, answer wrong words specifically with truth. Number two, tell the spirit that spoke those words to leave. And number three, worship. To hold your attention on God, on his word, and you're on your own spirit. Because the devil launches words against your mind to tighten in on your mind to draw you up into that mental arena because there's no faith there. As you worship, you're in the faith arena. So you're holding yourself in faith as you worship. And he cannot gain entrance where there's faith. Are you helped this morning? It took 12 years of my life to learn it. Don't you dare treat this like it's just another sermon. Don't you dare. I will come to your house and poke your door. Don't you That's my life. Laying in that sermon. You better treat it right. Get these things on the inside. Of you. And can I tell you what? I'll tell you this. That is not your revelation. Just because you heard me say it. It's not yours. Only the Holy Ghost can make that revelation to you. And how does he do that? If you'll meditate on it. He'll drive that thing into your spirit. If you're just going to walk out and dismiss it, not think anything of it, it will never become a living, vital truth in your life. And I say that not just with this sermon, any sermon that comes out of your pastor. 
You'll never take ownership of it until you put it in place in your life. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I appreciate. Jesus said, one of the characteristics of the last days is men's hearts will fail them for fear. People's bodies will shut down because of the fear they're tormented with. It'll shut down their bodies. Um, I heard one report, and this is just one doctor. Other doctors may have different st statistics that are even higher. And he said, every physical ailment I treat begins from the neck up. He said, 85% of every ailment, physical ailment I treat, begins from the neck up. Either they think wrong, so they did something wrong with their body. Or he said, they allowed something to trouble their mind, a worry. And it broke down their body. You say, well, mine's overeating. Well, that's thinking wrong. Amen. It's all thinking wrong. Amen. When the medical field can say, the majority of the problem begins up here. God's already in front of all that. He's told us what to do. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Proverbs 4.20, attend to my words. Incline thine ear into my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thy heart for their, their life. To those who find them. Wait a minute. They're not life to everyone. They're only life to those who find them. How do you know if you're finding them? If you're tending to his words. People will, people will confess when they get sick. Uh, his words are life to me. Not if you haven't been attending to them. They're not. <laughs> not trying to break your, bust your balloon, baby. But... <laughs> I'm just saying you can't live mindless toward the things of God and think they're going to dominate you. We have to live this every day. Let me just say this. We get to live this every day. We get to. I've seen family members, relatives, people I love that were troubled in their minds at times. And I decided, I'm not going to ever have that again. I will never have that again. And thank God he's enabled me to grow in skill. He's helped me. He's given me revelation and encouraged me and kept me going when it felt like quitting on that. But I tell you what, it's heaven on earth. Heaven on earth. And even when my husband went home to be with the Lord, the peace was not lost. The joy was not withdrawn. The flow of heaven was still my flow. Yeah. Circumstances can never ruin your life. Amen. I decided too, I'm not going to dread what I'm born for. Amen. Some people, oh, I, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. I know God's wanting me to do that. Listen, if he tells me to do something I'm born for, and I'm going to love every bit of it, and I'm not going to sit and argue with him. Amen. Well, I don't want to get up in front of people. I'm going to love what I'm born for. Yeah. It's choice. Amen. It's the choice of right thinking. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor, thank you so much. Wow. Praise God. Wow. That was so, I don't even have words. That was heavenly. And I'm not going to keep you. I'm not trying to preach another message. I'm just telling you, that was a visitation from heaven. How many of y'all with the show of hands would say that I ain't even said it yet, y'all raised it?